Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everyone to Beverly Hills Baptist Church to our Sunday night service. We thank you for tuning in. Let us open up with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for this day. We thank you that uh, fall weather has come and the evenings seem cooler. We thank you that you are still in control no matter what happens. And Father, we praise you and we thank you that we can gather here, even tonight via video, to hear the preaching of your word and to hear singing to your honor and your glory. And we thank you for everything that you are doing here at Beverly Hills. And it is in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Father, we pray for our prayer list and all the names that have been on there and who have uh, been added new. Uh, we pray, Father, that whatever the circumstance may be, whether, Father, someone is struggling financially, someone is struggling spiritually, uh, someone is struggling physically, Lord, with an illness, we pray that you would move in each and every individual situation. We pray, Father, that you would bring healing to those who are sick, comfort to those who have lost loved ones, and stability to those who are facing emotional struggles. And Father, we pray that you would just absolutely lay your hands of love and protection, of grace and mercy on us. Father, we thank you for Beverly Hills Baptist Church. I thank you for what it means to me and my family. I thank you for the love that they have shown us. And Father, we thank you that we can be a salt and light into our community to shine and to tell others about Jesus. We pray, Father, with our upcoming trunk retreat that you would use this as an opportunity for us to reach the gospel to our community. To tell those that Beverly Hills is here and that Jesus loves them and that he died for them. Father, we thank you for uh, letting us be able to move forward with our heating and air and all of that that we can do to take care of the church building, Father. And we pray that you would lead us and guide us as we take care of the spiritual needs here at the church. Father, we pray for our country and our nation. There is a darkness that is around this world, not just in the United States, but all around the world is a darkness that cannot be seen through, Father, because of the evil it is in this world. So, Father, I pray that you would shine a light that is Jesus Christ into the hearts of the darkened men. That, Father, their hearts would be illuminated and that they will come to know you. Men, women, children, those who do not know you as Lord and Savior. We pray that you would open up their hearts and their minds to see who you are. We pray, Father, for those who are working to keep us safe, our police, our fire, EMS and military. We pray that you will protect them, watch over them, and keep them safe, Father, as we enjoy the freedoms that we have here. Father, we know that absolute freedom only comes from knowing Jesus Christ. So I pray that you will open the hearts and minds of those who do not know and use us to reach out to them. Father, we thank you for this day, for your love, 
again for your grace and for your mercy. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Bibles and turn with me to Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12 and we will begin in verse 18. Mark chapter 12 and beginning in verse 18. My question for you tonight is this. Do you believe in life after death? Do you believe in life after death? Uh, as we are coming up on Halloween and the, the spooky uh, time of the month and as uh, we see uh, little kids dressed up as ghosts and goblins, it brings to mind the question of life after death. Do you believe in a life after this earth? Now, just about I would bet, as you are a Christian and as if you are watching this, then you absolutely believe in life after death. You believe in heaven. You understand there's a hell. You believe that uh, as a believer, your soul is saved and that you will live in eternity with heaven and a new heaven and a new earth in the presence of the Lord. And that is exactly what the scripture teaches us. But what you may not know is that just about every culture in the entire world from the beginning of history until now believe in life after death. There are only just a few who believe that once we die, our soul ceases to exist and that we don't experience anything after death. Uh, taking a look at a few examples, uh, did you know that in the ancient Egyptian book of the dead, there are full tales of life after death? The tomb of Pharaoh uh, Cephas, uh, who died some 5,000 years ago, contains a solar boat that was designed to carry him into the heavens and through eternity. Ancient Greeks were often buried with a coin in their mouth to pay the fare to cross the river Styx to the land of the dead. Some Native Americans were built... Uh, were, uh, excuse me, were buried with their bows and arrows and ponies so they could be ready to hunt when they arrived in the happy hunting grounds. Some of my most personal favorite stories I've read about mythology are the ancient Vikings. Now, they believed in a place called Valhalla and where they believed that they would fight all day and the dead would be raised at the end of the day and their wounds would be healed every evening. And then they would go all night feasting and drinking away, going about and fighting again the next day. And even Muslims look forward to their version of what they call heaven, where every sensual, physical pleasure can be indulged throughout eternity. Now, as I had said, from the beginning of time until now and still continuing on long before us and long after us, there are always beliefs or tales of life after death. We, as believers in Jesus Christ, have a very detailed account in some regards of what life looks like once we pass from this earth to the next. This is a question that comes from the Sadducees to Jesus. As they try to uh, capture him in a lie and find a reason why they can arrest him and put him to death. Tonight I want to take a look at the resurrection and the afterlife. Picking up in Mark chapter 12, beginning in verse 18, uh, the first thing we see in our story is the antagonist. And the Sadducees, as Mark uh, writes, came to him who say that there is no resurrection, and they asked him a question. 
Now, if we know from church history, we know that there was the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the scribes, and a lot of other Jewish leadership that made up what we call the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was 71 members of a high council that ruled the uh, uh, Jewish people. They ruled alongside and even were superior in their own right, in their own minds, against the Roman rulers. Now, made up this were the scribes, or those who translated the scriptures and made copies of scriptures. There was the Pharisees, who were uh, the lineage of the high priest, who would offer sacrifices in the temple. And then there was the Sadducees. Now, the Sadducees, unlike the Pharisees and the, the scribes, the Sadducees were a group of families, a lineage of families, uh, uh, particular men who came down, who knew the law, who studied the law, that were lawyers, but also were very particular wealthy. Now, the Sadducees held to just the Pentateuch, or the first five books of the Bible. They did not believe in anything else and did not follow other scriptures. But if you know about the Pharisees, they did. They had their own traditions, their own belief systems outside of just the first five books. They held to the prophets and to a lot of the poetry that had been written. And so when it comes to understanding the resurrection, the Sadducees do not believe that there is life after death. Now, they do believe that the soul goes to be with Jesus, or the soul goes to be with God, I should say. But they do not believe in the resurrection. Furthermore, because they do not believe in Jesus Christ, they do not believe in a second coming. Now, they had not heard of Jesus coming back. They knew that he was there. They were trying to persecute him because they did not believe that he was the Son of God. But in the first five books, as it mentions that there is the Son of God who will return, they do not believe in that. They do not hold to that. And so they are going to come and to trap him in a question that they feel will make him dishonor God and find reason to arrest him. Now this comes with some absurdity. The question they ask is absolutely just out of the question and just absolutely out of the mind. They come saying to him, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but leaves no child, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now that is exactly true. In the Old Testament law, it teaches us that if a man grows up and he marries a woman and he does not have any children, when he passes, his widow is left nothing. Because he is the man of the house in a Jewish culture, women did not own or have or possess anything. This is a, a particular very interesting story that takes place with Naomi and her daughter-in-law, Ruth, in the book of Ruth. But a man, if he marries and he passes and has no children, leaves a widow. Now, the scriptures told us that the brother of this man, if he had a brother, was to take this woman and to make him his wife, have children with her, and raise her up and raise the children up so that they may take care of their mother. Now, the question now becomes even more absurd is this. There were seven brothers, and the first, the oldest brother, took a wife, and when he died, he left no offspring. And the second took her as his wife, and then he died, and he had no offspring either. And the third, and likewise. So into the seventh, if we look at this story, the first brother dies, the second brother dies, the third brother dies, all of which marry this woman and yet have no offspring because the, the men of the family must be infertile. And so they are not able to have children. Because of this, she married all seven of them and none of them gave her a child. And the last of the woman also died. Now, she has no children to take care of her. Her life comes to an end and she passes, but she was married to seven brothers. Now, there is no case of this being found in Old Testament scriptures or Jewish biblical history. So it is very absurd to think that this would happen with seven brothers. But in their mind, they ask, in the resurrection, if there is a resurrection, as they should say, but in the resurrection, when they rise again, whose wife shall she be? Will she be the first wife or the, the wife of the first uh, or the, the wife of the seventh that had her? Who will be this woman's husband? She was married seven times and yet she had no children. So in the resurrection, they ask, who is going to take this wife? 
Who is she going to be married to? Now, they've completely bypassed the understanding of what it means of an eternal life. They bypass the understanding that it's not going to be the next life a repeat of this life. There are stories throughout all of culture who say that when we die, we go to heaven, and that maybe in some point in time, God uh, ceases everything to exist and recreates everything, just almost like a time loop. Now, the scriptures don't support that, but there are those who may hold to that. And that the Lord then takes the soul of someone who has existed and puts them in a new time period, in a new place, in a new life. Now, I'm not saying that there's any biblical support for that, and there's not. But there are countless stories of people who have mentioned things of that nature. But what the Sadducees seem to think is that when you die and you're resurrected, it's going to be a same repeat of the same life. The woman was married seven times. Who is her official husband? This is absurd. This story doesn't make sense. But they are looking for some way to trap him. And again, they're not looking for a serious answer. They're looking to arrest him so that they can put him to death. This brings us to the answer that Jesus is going to give them. Jesus says to them, is this not the reason you were wrong? And exactly. They are wrong. Is this not the reason you were wrong? Because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. And that is exactly right. They do not hold to the understandings of full scripture. They do not understand what's going on. And in fact, they underestimate the power of an almighty creator. They're thinking in such small, narrow terms that they miss the picture that Jesus puts before them. He says, for when they rise from the dead, they mean they will neither marry nor be given into marriage, but are like the angels in heaven. Now, Jesus explains in a very simple fashion that when the resurrection comes, we will all be resurrected, not as husband and wife, because there will be no need of marriage. If you go back to the scriptures, if you go back as the Sadducees should, and they look at the Old Testament understanding of why God proposed marriage, why God gave marriage for one man and one woman for companionship, was ultimately to multiply and to fill the earth. That was the idea of reproduction. But when we die in this life, when we go to the next in the resurrection, there will be no need to repopulate because all of those who are believers in Christ will be there together. So he says that they will be just like the angels in heaven in that they do not give in to marriage. Now, there is a few things I want you to see from this that this scripture has been used to twist. First and foremost, uh, we are not going to receive angel wings when we go to heaven. Uh, there isn't a, a, such a story as that lost souls, when they go to heaven and they are before God, and every time a bell rings, an angel gets their wings. That is not the case. When we as believers, when we go to heaven, we do not receive wings and become angelic-like. That is just not biblically supported. We will have new glorified bodies. I do not know what they will look like. I presume they will be the same visions of what we have, but we will not be hungry. We will not be hurt. There will be no more sadness and sorrow, so there will not be broken and aging bodies. But we do not receive angel wings. Also, it's very interesting to note just on the side that here it talks about angels not giving into marriage. Again, the reason why you go into marriage is to procreate, to enjoy companionship. We see here that the angels do not need to procreate, but it doesn't mean that they can't. Angels were not designed to multiply and fill the earth. But if we go back and look at some Old Testament scriptures, we can see where angels, uh, particularly fallen angels, uh, in the possessions of men, demonic angels in the possessions of men, used to procreate and create monsters in this world. Yes, that is biblical if you will look that up. Uh, take a look up in Job and Genesis and so on and so forth. But that's not the point. The point is, is that we understand the reason why we are in marriage is to have children. That was the fact of the original story. She married each brother as he passed to have offspring so that they would raise her and take care of their mother. But that not end up being the case. So we are not given into marriage. We were like the angels in heaven. And as for the dead being raised, you have not read the book of Moses. Now, Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, and the Sadducees were supposed to be experts in this. 
And yet somehow they miss this in the passage about the bush. How God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham, I am the God of Isaac, and I am the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but he is the God of the living. And as God spoke to Moses and as he told him in the burning bush, that lineages before, I am the God of Abraham, I am the God of Isaac, I am the God of Jacob, I am the God of all of those who are living and who have passed and will continue to be the only God that is in existence. But the living, he tells them in the last four words to the uh, Sadducees, very point blankly, you are quite wrong. There is a life after this life. There is a time period that we will experience after this life. It's not just a cute story that we tell ourselves when a loved one passes away. To say that they're in a better place or that they're no longer suffering. Yes, it is nice to know, but it's actually true that there is a glorious place that we go called heaven. A place set for sight of us. The scriptures tell us that this is a place where there are many rooms that we will dwell in the house of God. Revelation is colored with beautiful stories and pictures of the second coming that will be. And that how we will live in the pearly gates. We will walk down streets of gold. We will be in a place of heaven that is of such beauty. But the most glorious thing of all of that is not the streets of gold or the gates of pearl. Not to see the loved ones, but to see our Savior face to face. That is what is the greatest thing about eternity. But that is also what is the saddest thing about damnation of not knowing Jesus Christ and spending eternity in hell. Is the separation from the love of God. We know the love of God because he outpours it freely to us here. But when damnation comes to those who do not believe, they will be cut off from the love of God. They will have an experience that we call uh, just exasperated desperateness, lostness. What we call an existential crisis because they will no longer know what it is to feel love from an eternal God. But those who know and those who believe will experience that love. In seeing this, as Jesus has answered their question, it brings into conclusion uh, what a French philosopher put forth as a wager. Uh, the French philosopher Blaise Pascal uh, brings to mind what this intends to explain. In Pascal's wager, he explained to those who were wanting to understand life after God, or life after death, excuse me, that there either is a God and there is not a God. And you either believe in God or you do not believe in God. It's very simple. There either is God or there is not. You believe or you don't. Now, if you believe in God and God exists, you will experience eternal happiness. Not only here in this life, but in the life after. And living your life and that it will be with God. Now, if you believe in God and God does not exist... You still live a blessed life here as you are devoted to him, but that when you die, you've lost nothing. Your soul ceases to exist, and you experience nothing. But if you don't believe in God, and God does not exist, and you take that wager, then you've gained nothing, but you've lost nothing. You go through life miserable, and then you die, and then you don't are not miserable anymore. But then here comes the question. What if you don't believe in God, but God exists? And you step in from this life into the next, and you experience damnation firsthand, separation from God, a life of torment and torture because you chose not to believe in the Bible, because you chose not to believe in God. If we take a look at history of every piece of information that's ever been written from beginning to end, we have more scriptures, more manuscripts, and more copies of the Word of God than we have of any ancient context. A lot of mythological stories uh, have holes filled in by the imaginations of people even today as they come up with stories to fill the gaps. But with scripture, there are no gaps. There are no holes. 
We have a complete understanding of history from beginning to end. There are things that the scriptures may not tell us, but God knows. And they are there. And they are there for us to know when we pass from this life to the next. Are you willing to wager your life now versus the life after? Are you willing to take the fate of stepping into the next life and experiencing life or death or nothing at all? My prayer is is that you will put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, knowing that the life after is so much sweeter than the life now. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love, for your grace, and for your mercy. And Father, we pray that you would just pour out your love upon us. Thank you, Father, for letting us see this story and understanding that there is a life to come after this, and that there's so much more glories that we will see. And especially seeing our creator and our savior and our sustainers face to face. Father, we love you. We praise you. And we thank you for this day. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you will stand, you can sit. But will you listen as the Lord speaks to your heart and mind as we have our hymn of invitation. Father, we thank you for this day, for your love, grace, and mercy. Father, be with us now as we step out into the week. Father, as there are struggles to come, let us turn to you to put our faith and trust in you. As there are those who are hurting and broken, let us turn our attention to pray for them. To those who are lost, we pray that you would lead us and guide us to tell them about the good news of Jesus Christ. And Father, we do all of that for your honor and your glory. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.